Um, for those of you who would like to share it, feel free to go ahead and do that now. We would love to have more people being able to watch and access this. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Julie Tai. I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. Our mission at the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund is to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment. We equip voters with information about climate and sustainability issues, and we encourage them to hold candidates accountable to their promises. As you know, living in Suffolk County means interacting with environmental issues on a daily basis. With vast opportunities like offshore wind and clean transportation to tremendous challenges like groundwater contamination and rising sea levels, mm -hmm. this district is at the forefront of modern environmental policy. Luckily, the district has been well served for decades by Senator Ken Lavelle. He has been a longtime champion for the environment and worked tirelessly to conserve Long Island's natural, natural areas, including sponsoring the landmark Pine Barrens Preservation Act, which will protect environmentally sensitive gener lands for generations to come. We want to make sure the next senator follows in Ken Lavelle's footsteps and continues to keep the environment a top priority. That's why we're holding this forum tonight, to make sure the environment is top of mind for both candidates and voters. Climate change is a continuous reminder that our actions affect the environment and what happens when we don't work to advocate for it. By being here, all of you are helping us send a message that New Yorkers care about having a healthy environment, a livable climate for future generations, and are paying attention during this election. I wanna thank all of our valuable partners for this forum. Citizens Campaign for the Environment, Climate Reality Project New York State Coalition, Climate Jobs New York Education Fund, Friends of Georgia Capon, Group for the East End, and the Long Island Farm Bureau. Because this is a virtual forum, let me go over some of the ground rules before we start. We'll start with an opening statement from our first candidate. Our moderator will proceed with some questions and we'll throw in some lightning round, short yes or no type questions, emphasis being on short. We'll then ask a few audience questions. After that, we'll hear from our second candidate and ask them all of the same questions. As a reminder, the same questions will be asked by both can to both candidates, so please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A function by 6.30. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator. Denise Civiletti is the publisher and editor of Riverhead Local. Welcome, Denise. Hi, how are you, Julie? Good, thank you. We are looking forward to this. And um, we're gonna, as you said, ask the same questions of each candidate. We are going to start with Mr. Palumbo, is that correct? Are you there? Okay. I'm, I'm you can here, hear me. yes. Very I'm good. Here. Okay. How are you doing, Tony? Um, so the speaking of climate, <laughs> the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act sets ambitious goals for New York to have 100% clean energy by 2040 and be 100% carbon neutral by 2050. Further legislation will undoubtedly be required in the years to come to help meet these goals. What are some bills that you would introduce or co-sponsor to help New York achieve its climate goals? Well, sure. And thank you to the uh, League of Conservation Voters for having this forum. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you all. And uh, really, you know, you, you need to keep in mind that in the first Senate district, there is the largest solar farm east of the Mississippi. Um, I did vote for the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, and I think that the, as the technology increases, we need to continue to encourage um, not only businesses and, but, and individuals, but even uh, municipalities and school districts to go re into renewables. Um, I personally just have gone renewable in, uh, at my home. We went solar. Um, and it's really a wonderful thing that it's, of course, is a significant upfront investment um, in order to get to that point. But obviously, over time, um, it is certainly the way to go to obviously reduce our carbon footprint. So when you think about, for example, school districts, um, I was just discussing this the other day that um, I remember a debate on the floor a few years ago where Shoreham School District, uh, I mean, um, Sachem School District, in a little further up the island, um, spends over $200,000 a month on their LIPA bill. Um, so these are the things that I, I think we are absolutely going in the right direction. And this... Um, the groups that are participating today are all on the right page with wind and water, um, wind, wind, water, and solar, really. Um, so specifically, to give you more specific bills, I have 
um, always voted in that regard. I've been on the Environmental Conservation Committee um, for the past seven years, my entire tenure in the assembly. So this is something that um, you know is, is near and dear to our hearts, and particularly since I live so far east. Um, this the East End is is its own has its own dynamic. Um, it's environmentally sensitive, um, and this is something that um, you know as far as our ultimate goal of 100% renewable. Um, we do have some parameters within that act to modify it as, as it becomes practical, but I see them out of time. But that is certainly something that is laudable and we will get there someday in the near future, hopefully sooner rather than later. Okay, Tony, lightning round question for you. Have yeah. you ever driven an electric car? I have. What kind of car was it? Yes, it was a Tesla. And I now, um, I'm in the market, my son, is kind of obsessed with it and he constantly is sending me used deals and trying to get me to make an appointment he just got his permit so uh i i think i may be going since now we're solar at the house all i need is the plug and the power of the sun can beautifully provide me fuel isn't that wonderful that's a wonderful thing very good okay our next question for you um as you know the parts of long island that are encompassed by the first uh, Senate district are renowned for their natural beauty. Um, our district's economy is also very dependent on its proximity to the ocean. Given the threats that rising sea levels and more extreme weather pose to District 1's ecos ecosystems and its economy, what are your priorities for climate resiliency? Sure, and you know, we, we can't, the dynamics of this district are such that you cannot sewer um, you cannot sewer the East End. It just geographically is impossible. Um, but you, we also keep in mind the CPF, the Community Preservation Fund, that was uh, really groundbreaking legislation in the five Eastern towns, for many of you know, and for those of you who don't, it's a 2% tax that we allowed local option, which I always think is the way to govern properly, bring in all the stakeholders, like we do every year, the um, Assemblyman Thiel, Assemblyman Engelbright, Senator Laval and myself have been doing an environmental roundtable so you can run this by everyone and do it properly. And with the Community Preservation Fund, that was done um, and is now being done around the state where this fund is created for the purchasing of development rights, maintaining our open space. And now, just two years ago, we included in the budget and modified it so that 20% of that fund can now be used for water quality. So when you say rising seas, those issues, we can now use this fund, for example, just East Hampton Town has made $60 million in their CPF fund so far this year because land is exploding since what's going on in the city. Everyone kind of moved this way. Um, and um, our schools are, are increasing in, in enrollment. Um, so we, there's a lot of real estate action out here, but that fund can be used now for water quality, for stormwater runoff, for our nitrogen issues. And that is really an, an, an amazing piece of legislation because that gives us now a war chest that is not necessarily funded by the, uh, any particular municipal agency. It's done when someone purchases a home. It goes into that, the money goes into that fund. And now that we can use it for water quality and sustainability, um, we can do what we need to do as far as seawalls. And, and, and as I said, up to 20% of it now, we may have to adjust it as, as, uh, the, the, as we see fit in the future. But that's the right idea because now we can, we can invest not only in proper septic and dealing with the nitrogen issue, um, but, but all other water quality issues on the East End. Okay. Um, do you have any specific priorities for the things that need to be fixed or that, need, that, need, that you need to look at for climate uh, resiliency? Well, sure. When I say fix, just to adjust, and, and that's really, the, it, it originally was only to be used to purchase development rights of land, the CPF. So when I say not necessarily fix, that like something is broken, but to be adjusted as is, is depending on the levels of, of need that now we have purchased, we've earned, we, that fund has earned over $1 billion since its inception. Um, and it was set to expire. I believe it was, we moved it to 2030. And then a couple of years ago, we extended it to 2050. Um, and that's the importance of that legislation because that gives us the ability to have that money. And then if we need to use more than that, because we're actually in, in a good fashion, we're buying up so much development, so many development rights that um, it, it's not, uh, we're running out of land to buy. 
so we can use it for other environmentally sound policies. And that's what I say when I mean fix or adjust that. I think that's just been such groundbreaking legislation when it was implemented. And now, as I said, we see other communities doing that around the state because it's worked so well. Okay, lightning round question. Do you bring reusable bags to go shopping? Um, I do, I do now. I was a little resilient, I was, I was a little uh, reluctant. Um, but now, now we do. And we have a million of them in the back of the car, which is nice. So that you always know when you need one. So, and I, I often go in because I, I, do, I do shop occasionally, not most of the time, but I'll go in without the bag, which is really nice too. When I'm in there and I've already gotten six things, I have six things in my hands and I say, oh, I forgot my bag. And then I have to run out and get it. But yes, For some I reason you always see guys doing that. I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. Because we only go for about five things, not 50. Uh, next question is about uh, pollinators. Uh, you know, pollinators like honeybees, beetles, butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, they're indispensable components of our food web, uh, yet they are threatened by pesticides known as neonics. Neonics have been detected in Long Island groundwater, and in June of this year, something I just learned, Cornell Cooperative released a report on neonics in New York State, neonics, I think is how you're supposed to say it, and found that routine use of this is a hard one. Neonicotoid treated seeds <laughs> did not increase production of corn and soybeans and posed a significant hazard for pollinators. And those are coated seeds. They're coated with this insect uh, pesticide. Um, if elected, how would you protect pollinators in New York? Would you support a bill to ban coated seeds? You know, we've had Chairman Engelbright, who is the chairman of the, um, of the Environmental Conservation Committee in the Assembly, who I've become very friendly with and collaborated with since I've been there um, is uh, it has been really out on the front end of this and his district is on Long Island it's just west of, of mine um, he did prepare he does have the birds and the bees act to focus on pollinators and and the concerns that you're discussing and the real issue is we are sole source aquifer so once it starts to affect our water what that means of course for most of you know who are listening um, is that our, our, we drink from the water we're standing on or, or from the, the, the land that we're standing on. The aquifer below us is where we get our drinking water and that is of significant concern. We have the intrusion of, of many chemicals that are a problem. So yes, I would support that. Um, I do think there needs to be a balance um, because we have, and uh, we just dealt with this the other day, that um, the people don't, many people don't realize that based upon the, the nature of Suffolk County, we are still number four in the state as far as ag production. Um, so we have a huge farming industry as well. So there needs to be a balance between, uh, you know, what, obviously if there's an adverse impact, then, then it needs to be dealt with. But, um, you know, that, that's the, the issue with the pesticides, obviously, is dealt with mostly in the farming industry. Um, although, quite frankly, the, 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 the bigger issue um, in recent years has been nitrogen, and that's from our septic. And that's why we have now advanced septic systems trying to deal with that issue. So we're making progress in all those directions. Um, but the short answer to your question is yes, I would support such a bill. We just need to, as I mentioned earlier, like we do with the round table, bring in all the stakeholders and find the reasonable middle that will make obviously, most importantly, our water safe, um, that will obviously address the other issues that I just mentioned. Well, um, great segue, because the next question has to do with nitrogen pollution. and um, I, the, how it um, affects our, our water. Um, you know, excessive nitrogen pollution, pollution from inadequately treated sewage is linked to shellfish die-offs, toxic tides, beach closures, degradation of wetlands, many of the things we've unfortunately seen um, on the East End over the last several years. Uh, to address this problem, New York State earmarks $75 million with $10 million allocated to Suffolk County to provide grants to replace polluting antiquated septic and cesspool systems for those new innovative um, nitrogen reducing septic systems that um, we're rolling out here in Suffolk County. Um, despite this infusion of grant funding, a stable recurring revenue stream is really needed to fully address nitrogen pollution. If elected, how would you help Suff Suffolk County fight nitrogen pollution? Will you support a recurring revenue stream? And what, what do you see that revenue stream doing? 
Sure, and and you're right, and 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 that's that's that was contemplated when we extended the CPF and added water quality to it. We have four hundred thousand septic systems um, on Long Island, and I believe East Hampton, um, and it, it's be, being contemplated also on on the county level um, that every renovation that's more than 50% or new home would include these IA systems, these innovative advanced septic systems, which essentially reduce the nitrogen to close to zero before the effluent goes into the soil. Um, so that's really the smartest thing. What, what would I do is I would continue, um, quite frankly, what we've already done is, which has been very, very conscious of it and created revenue streams such as the CPF. That was the reason why we did what we did. Um, and that can, needs to continue. Um, I would support doing, doing a, a bill or, or, or I, would, I would provide local option because it may not work um, for every single community. Um, but that happened again with the CPF. We provided local option. Eventually, everyone came along when they saw how well it was working. Um, and that's really what's important is um, that is a, a bill similar to some subsidy or creating some subsidies, uh, which Assemblyman Thiel and I have had before uh, regarding the IA systems. Um, and, and that's really something that I think we should really consider um, to do statewide, that we can do this, most importantly, in Nassau and Suffolk County, that we should be doing this uh, sooner rather than later, because we're making progress, as I said, but with 400,000 systems, um, it, we have a long way to go. We can't just say we're going to sewer the community, as I said before, because the geography of the East End won't, won't permit that. Okay, very good. Um, lightning round question. Do you carry a reusable water bottle? I don't, my children do. <laughs> Short answer. No, I don't, okay. <laughs> I, I don't, but I do use the same cup at, at my office. I use it, I have a ceramic cup that I use from the water jug at my <laughs> office at least, so. Okay. Um, do you support clean, renewable energy resources like offshore wind? And if so, how will you be a champion for this once in a generation industry that's coming to Long Island? If not, please provide your reasoning. Sure, and I do, I do support it. Um, what's really enjoyable and nice to have seen is that I believe in, in just recent weeks, we understand that the megawatt production and efficiency of the proposed offshore project um, off, of, off of Long Island is significantly increased. The, the technology and efficiency has improved, and that's, that's great news um, because I know that's been, um, that's, that's been a concern with, with wind, but I'm absolutely supportive of all renewables, um, and specifically wind is a good idea. And again, this is another one where there was a little bit of a response where people flinched when they heard where it was going to be, I know the fishing industry had a concern, which is also a very big industry on the East End. So, I mean, for example, um, we created Marine Mammal Preserve and Chairman Engelbright and I were co-sponsoring around Plum Island, this preserve, and we had a huge immediate concern from the fishing industry. And really they didn't understand the nuance of what we were looking to do, so we pulled the bill. And again, it's part of a carrot and stick discussion, but you need to just make sure everyone is properly educated on what we're going to do with these issues and what, and what we're looking to accomplish and take their input. We're not experts at everything. I know most people in government think that, and it's hard to believe, Denise, but yes, we don't know everything as much as we like to think we do. Um, and that's why you bring in the experts or just stakeholders, like I said, and make sure that this is done properly and with, with community support. And you can even sell them on it and have public forums and say, look, this is what we're going to do and educate them. And then everyone seems to calm down. So I think that is happening as well. There was some backlash regarding the offshore project of Montauk, but um, it's I think it's going in the right direction and I do support it. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, Julie, is it time for uh, audience questions? Uh, if you have more questions, we have time for that. Uh, but if not, we can move to audience questions. Okay. Um, well, I had um, I had selected five, but I can uh, get another one. <laughs> Let me. I just have to go to a different document. There. Um, assuming I can find the other document. 
I am so sorry. That's I should have, I should have thought to I leave can, it. I can ask an audience here. question while, while you do that. Um, so we have a question about agriculture. Uh, as you noted, Assemblyman, agriculture underpins the economy and culture of Eastern Long Island. If elected, how would you specifically advocate for maintaining and hopefully expanding farming in the district? Sure. Well, I've always, um, every year that I've been in the Assembly, I've been a, a friend of the Farm Bureau because that is, it drives our economy, particularly in New York State. Um, and, and that's really the dynamic that, that is part of that balance. Um, they are open space. So if we continue in, in any respect, or if there is some sort of a, um, an over, let me put it this way. Our business climate in New York has not been good. And they're small businesses. And the continued legislation that I think is, is adversely affecting businesses, um, that if that if we continue to do that and our businesses disappear, speaking from an environmental perspective, what do you think is going to happen to that land? We have houses right now that are listed for hours and in contract. People are fleeing New York City like it's on fire. What's going to happen to our district? Well, we're going to ha have it chopped up into more McMansions. So farming is crucial to this district. And I've always been a big supporter of it. And I will continue to vote. My votes speak for themselves, I believe. Um, in that regard, as far as the balance between the environment and our farming industry, because they can coexist and they absolutely do on the East End, particularly in Senate District 1. Okay, I have a sixth question if we're going to have time to ask each candidate or do you want to continue with the audience questions, Julie? You can go back to your question right now. Okay. Um, so I think this is key, especially in the time of COVID and the pain that everybody's feeling right now. And you just alluded to it, Tony, um, the, um, you know, getting the stakeholders involved. Um, education and grassroots organizing is the key to community support and engagement. Um, do you plan on actively engaging with environmental groups and coalitions via town halls and Zoom meetings like this, if elected? Without question, I've been doing it since I've been in office. Um, the environmental roundtable, as I've said previously, we've done, and that's been Senator Laval's thing. Um, and Senator Laval, who is, uh, is retiring after 44 years, has been a tremendous advocate for the environment. Um, he's endorsing me and actually threatened me that, if I, that he'll come after me if I don't continue the environmental roundtable. Not that I needed any persuasion because I will certainly, I'm, I'm doing it, I'll be doing it voluntarily. I'm lucky enough to win the seat. Um, but yes, that, that's really the most important thing is to have the discussions with stakeholders, particularly environmental groups on all these issues. I mean, we had an issue with train service where on the North Fork, which really the South Fork was the pilot plan or the pilot program for the North Fork, we now have such an influx of people over the past 15 years or so, we need to get cars off the road. We had one train that would come deadhead from Ronkonkoma to Greenport, and then they would have one train go out to the city and one train come back. That wasn't cutting it. So we met with the MTA, with the Long Island Railroad, and we and myself, Assemblyman Thiel, and Senator Laval had many, many meetings. And ultimately now we have four on the North Fork because that's smart. That's the sign of the times. And these are things that are moving and to meet saying meeting with stakeholders. Um, you know, we had other groups also help persuade them and say, look, if you build it, they will come. Nobody's using the train because it's, it's useless. So they now have, they no longer have a deadhead from Ronkonkoma and we have much more significant train service on the North Fork. That's just smart. That's good government, in my opinion, is you just, you don't just jam it down people's throats and say, this is because I say so. You can put together empirical data and you can put together people who know the issues tightly and specifically and have been dealing with it for years. And you can use that to persuade simply it's not just something that you think is a bright idea. It's something that is, 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 co is common sense and reasonable. Okay. Um, Julie? I have an audience question. Um, will you fight to keep the Environmental Protection Fund fully funded at $300 million and help fend off budget cuts next year from environmental programs? Yes, and we've actually had, um, of course, and, and the 300 million, um, we'd like to see that it creeped up over the past few years. One year they were looking to rate it. Um, I know even locally that was a big issue. 
where we would send subsidies to the county and the money would be earmarked for the environmental fund on the county level. And because of the woes of Suffolk County, they would take it out from the other side um, because the earmarked funds would go in, but an equal amount would come out um, and go into the general fund. So these are things that um, are really frustrating. And again, this is such an environmentally sensitive district. I think it's the most sensitive one in the state because we have all those issues between our lakes and estuaries and tidal wetlands um, and that we drink from a sole source aquifer. All of that confluence of issues creates this, it makes us such a sensitive district when it comes to the environment. You have to be conscious of it. I live out on the east end of it. Um, you know, and uh, you know, many people up the island don't even get it, even in the west end of my district. Um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's really something that I think you have to live here to see how much this is a part of our way of life. Um, and, and particularly now that I'm, in, I'm out in the town of South Hole. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very different than even central Suffolk County where you get to really see that dynamic, but we all drink from the same aquifer. So um, that's something that uh, is, is very important, obviously. So the next question we have is um, meeting our emission reduction goals will require faster, more reliable mass transit. So the train the, that you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, more widespread electric vehicle charging infrastructure and more use of environment, EVs in general and easier ways to travel by bike and on foot. How do you think the state should meet these challenges? You know, what's, what's unique to the first Senate district because the North Fork has now been discovered and is becoming a lot like the South Fork where you have the commuter connection that was funded. It wasn't funded this year, unfortunately, because of the budget problems, but that's an Assemblyman Fields district with Senator Laval fought for that. And as I mentioned, the train, the train issues, um, it's that last mile, as we call it out here, where you can get from the city or from your destination or from your origin up west and you can get to the train station or you can get to a bus stop on the main roads, but you can't get to your house. So um, electric bikes have now been approved in Suffolk County and we voted for that. And um, those are the type of creative things we need to think about. We've even discussed water taxis. There, were, there is a transportation district where we've had many forums trying to figure out how to skin that cat because that is the problem. Um, and if any of you right now, want, even now since with COVID, the season is extended. Anybody wants to try and make a left turn um, on a Saturday midday, you know, good luck for those of you who don't live all the way out east. That we have a huge influx of, of, of people. Our population triples in the summertime, um, and on the North Fork, it goes all the way through pumpkin picking season and through Thanksgiving to uh, you know through through harvest season. Um, so that's really the biggest issue. Is it, it's a problem, and we the train service was helpful. Um, people are using it and they're starting to use it more, but I think the last mile, the commuter connection, um, which is a little short train jump um, and, a, and a little a more bus service and even uh, bicycles, that rentable bicycles um, would be very helpful to get more cars off the road. Okay, great. Uh, Denise, I think you have another question. I do, I have a couple more really. <laughs> so um, one thing I was interested in learning is, um, if you're elected to the Senate, Tony, what committees would you seek to serve on and why? I think very, this is pretty much the same committees that I've been on in the assembly. Um, Want to talk about those? Sure. Be, being a lawyer, um, I am, you know, I, I'm, and, and a former prosecutor, I'm the ranking Republican on the Judiciary Committee. I've been for several years, but I'm on environmental conservation. I'm on codes, which is anything with a penalty, but a lot of environmental protection statutes come through there as well. Um, and those seem to be really, I think, the, the most critical ones to really, I, I love the subject matter, and uh, more importantly, it's relevant to my district. I've been on, as I said, environmental conservation um, since I got there, because this is of significant concern. Um, you know, maybe even agricultural, if, if, if that, if ag is, uh, it is available and there's no conflict. I, I wasn't able to get on it because it did conflict with other, uh, some other of my committees as far as the typical time slots during the week. But um, those would really be, um, I mean, relative to this issue, environmental conservation. Um, I've been on consumer protection as well. That those have to do with these kind of issues. But when you think about the dynamics of this district, um, 
you know, other than my expertise as a lawyer all these years, be it for judiciary and codes, I think environmental conservation is, is critical um, because that is it is such an important issue to, to, to SD1, let me say that, to Senate District Number 1. Absolutely. Um, if you would go back, let's go back. To, it's a, a pretty big issue right now and still uh, pending. The, uh, the innovative septic systems, the innovative mm -hmm. treatment systems. Do you support what's being proposed in Suffolk County right now? And um, how, how would you propose, or what could you do to provide funding to help homeowners install those systems? Sure, you know, there was kind of a constitutional issue to use taxpayer money for private use, um, but I think there could be subsidies, almost like we do with solar, um, where if you do it, that we would give you a grant in that regard or give you an incentive on your taxes that you could deduct a certain number. You know, you went solar, you got a $5,000 rebate um, over the previous years um, for doing so. And sim similar to that, that if you do it voluntarily, or as I said, implementing um, statutes that would require you to upgrade in the event you do more than a 50% renovation or a new construction. Um, and the costs are coming down, but it's still almost double what an ordinary septic design would cost. Um, so I think that would really be the way to go, that that would be smart and really helpful to our nitrogen issue. Because uh, as I said, I think the number is still around 400,000 homes with septic. Three, that's, 350, that's 400,000, it's a huge number. And, and that's what's pending right now in the Suffolk legislature, as you know. Um, Yes. Uh, so you're saying that um, w with this rebate or credit, would that be an income tax credit or a property tax reduction? Well, I think we'd have to do it by income tax. That would probably be the only way that we could facilitate something like that. Okay. Um, but uh, that, that would be smart. And, and that's because that, that overall assessment might um, probably would increase the value of your home, of your home you would think, because it's a new upgraded system. Um, but, the, but the, the technology is advancing every day. We have more and more vendors who are approved countywide. So we're, we're, we're hopeful that the trend will continue. And as I said, along with, the, along with wind and all the renewables and all of these innovative type of technologies, we're, it, we're going in the right direction and we'll get there. That things are, they're improving every day and that's wonderful news. Um, I think we have time for at least one more here. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about um, the former Grumman site. Um, would you use your Senate position to help get the Superfund site, the Calverton Superfund site in Riverhead cleaned up by the Navy and Norfolk Grumman? You know, there are some issues there. We're learning uh, new things about um, what's there um, every day. And um, the Navy, the town just agreed to enter into an agreement to give them access to do some additional investigation for PFAS and PFOA. And um, I'm wondering how would you use your Senate position to uh, facilitate that? Well, that, it, just as we had to do um, with the uh, Beth Page plume, right? It took how many years for finally for that to get moving and to put money on it? Um, but you can certainly. Um, have that influence and, and get it going. That yeah, I think you need the empirical data to establish, uh, first of all, that it is in fact a super fun site, and then do the remediation. It's something that we could even we could fund with state with state money, um, and even I think you could even um, attempt to get some subrogation or get some money from the feds to 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 pay back. Um, but that's that's an issue. Those chemicals exist. Um, we need to get a little bit better handle on where, where and what the, to what extent. But uh, once that's together, if, and if, it's, if it truly becomes or is a super fun site, we need to move as quickly as we can um, again. And just it all comes back to our issues with uh, our sole source aquifer. I mean, we had in my district two years ago, we had about 840 acres that it was an ex of pine barrens preserved. We extended the pine barrens into that, that uh, west end of my district um, because of our, we, the Pine Barrens ultimately act like the, the carbon, the filter in your refrigerator for our rainwater um, to help with, with the purification of, uh, of the aquifer. So, you know, this, this, this is crucial. This is a big issue. This is Long Island and these are our problems. So 
uh, remediating that site is absolutely critical um, in the event that uh, there is a problem. Okay. Um, there, there is an interest from uh, the audience in also asking a follow-up question related to Calverton. Um, and what do you think the best use of that site would be? <sighs> that's a that's a tough one. I don't know. That that's a really personal. That's almost like a lightning round question. You know, personally, I I think it, it was such an economic driver of the East End when it was Grumman. I mean, it employed so many people and um, created so many collateral. Um, advantages, if you want to call it that, you know, people getting lunch, living in the area. Um, so I'd like to have to make it a business center. Um, we have discussed um, extension of the railroad because there is a track that could get you there. It's kind of an arm that shoots off of it to have a commuter um, aspect to it so that we're not piling more cars into Riverhead. Um, but uh, that, that's, that's a tough one. I can't, I don't have any specific ideas um, like to give you the name of a, of a business or, or, or a general industry there, but I think it should be um, properly and safely developed um, if, if, if it can be done in an environmentally conscious way. So I think we need to first determine what's, what's in the soil and what can be fixed. Um, but that's, that is the way I think that we could really create a dynamic in, in the East End where we have controlled development in one particular area and then continue to preserve and keep the beauty and bucolic nature of the East End, um, certainly like we've done uh, so far by purchasing development rights. Okay, are there any other audience questions, Julie? Yes, yep, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, uh, one of our audience members is asking that the, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act did not include uh, prevailing wage, for example, that had been discussed during the negotiations, but it ultimately was not included in the final outcome. And so the question is, is would you support and advocate for prevailing wage standards on uh, renewable energy projects um, that are part of that law? Um, I would, as if they're getting state subsidies, I would. If it's a totally private project, probably not. Um, but I do believe if there that, uh, and I did vote for some expansion of prevailing wage. Um, so I think it should apply in, in, in certainly municipal projects. Um, so that's, that's something that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to really see the specifics of the project in order to give you a, a more clear answer. But um, that's something that, uh, you know, that, that would, We'd have to see. I'd, have, I'd really have to see the specifics of, of the um, RFP before I would even answer that further. Okay. Um, you know, we, there was a, a comment that, you know, there was a recent article in NPR that's talked about how little of the plastic that we, that we use or we attempt to recycle is actually turned into new things. Um, much of it is, is buried or, or otherwise disposed of. What do you think we should be doing as a state to reduce the amount of plastic waste that we are generating? Well, I think we should start, what, we don't even do it in our schools. I think that's something that we could teach our kids a different way of life. You know, my daughter for her 12th birthday asked for the reusable straw because she wanted to save the turtles. Her brother, of course, gave her a hard time. But, um, you know, these are sort of things that I think certain, once we make it just a way of life, I think that uh, recycling, for example, um, then our kids will do it and the next generation will be 10 times better than we are. And uh, that, that's really what, what I think is, is, would be a good start. And, um, and maybe even combining, uh, combining resources by way of um, inter-county and inter-town with, with amongst the towns I know in Brookhaven that uh, Supervisor Ed Romaine did create a, um, a, a recycling center that was taking recyclables from other municipalities so that we could cut costs. And combining those types of agencies, I think is smart. So I think that's, that's one of the things that we should consider um, is specifically regarding, regarding the renewables is one, why don't we teach our kids and recycle in schools? That's kind of an easy answer um, and an easy thing to do. And then otherwise, I think shared services is really the, the best way to make it more viable and uh, more cost efficient because it's expensive. 
Okay, great. I think, Denise, I think um, it is time for us to move to closing statements. Think about a closing statement. Okay. Um, so, Tony, you have uh, three minutes to wrap up with a closing statement um, about your campaign and uh, why you should be elected to uh, succeed Senator Lavelle. Well, sure. Well, I, I certainly appreciate it, and Julie and Denise and everyone else and the League of Conservation Voters. Um, this is, I think, um, it's, a, it's, it's a straightforward, there are a lot of straightforward issues um, when you're a legislator, regardless of party, um, that uh, are, are really just drawn out for you and very clear based upon the places where you live. And I live here in this beautiful east end of Suffolk County, and particularly in Senate District 1, and this is, as I've said many times, is the most environmentally sensitive, in my opinion, district. But this is something that it has to be an issue on the forefront of your minds um, because we're drinking from a sole source aquifer and life is changing. Our carbon footprint is always a concern. And uh, as long as we continue to do, like I mentioned, we've been doing for years, the environmental round table and we bring in all the stakeholders and everyone to discuss these issues we need to continue to move forward in the fashion that we have. Um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, as I said, was something I voted for. The Clean Water Act, I've always advocated for that, for in increasing the Environmental Protection Fund um, and continuing to stay focused on these issues because this is our way of life. We don't have clean water, um, we don't have a place to live. Um, and as someone who's very active in, in, um, in recreational use of these waters myself, um, we, we can never forget that. So that's, that's important. I think my voting record clearly speaks that. Um, so based upon my experience, um, you don't need to take my word for it. You can just look at, look at my votes. Um, and that really, when I've had the opportunity to take the position that is, of, that is for the environment, I always have. Um, so it's not about me professing pr pr some uh, position that I intend to take. It's what I've already done. So I think that uh, my record certainly proves that. And I hope, hopefully you folks will consider me um, for your endorsement this year. And ultimately, if, if this goes my way, obviously my door will always be open um, to all the environmental issues and environmental agencies that are participating today. Thank you. Great. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Samyaman. We appreciate you participating here tonight. Um, we have been joined by Laura Ahern, but while we, while we have a moment between candidates, we are doing a very quick poll um, uh, asking people just a little bit about um, how you heard about the event today, uh, how you're planning on voting. For example, I voted early in the, in the, in the June primary, which was very easy, um, something that we're going to be encouraging more people to do. Um, and so if you could answer, it's a quick three uh, question poll um, that uh, we would appreciate folks answering. That would be terrific. Um, and we will just take one moment um, before we start with um, our next candidate. So we'll give everybody just a minute to finish, to, to answer that poll. Okay. Um, Denise, if you would okay. like to things off sure where's where's Laura <laughs> I don't see her okay. <laughs> it's hard to talk to someone when you don't see them but anyway <laughs> hi Laura wherever you are um, hey how you doing Can you <laughs> there you go okay <laughs> okay there we go. <laughs> um, good evening thank you for joining us um, I am uh, going to ask you a series of questions and I'm going to sprinkle in between some uh, what they call lightning round questions, which are just uh, real quick questions and quick answers. Um, I'll be asking you the same questions that we just asked uh, Assemblyman Palumbo. Um, first question is, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act sets some ambitious goals for New York to have 100% clean energy by 2040 and be 100% carbon neutral by 2050. Further legislation will undoubtedly be required in the years to come to help meet these goals. What are some bills you would introduce or co-sponsor to help New York achieve its climate goals? Thank you, Denise, thank you for that question. Um, 
you're right, our um, increasing climate footprint is having such a significant impact and Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act um, has set some standards that we um, need to meet in order to reduce our carbon footprint and to become carbon neutral. So there are so many pieces of legislation, I don't even know where to start. Um, I probably would want to, um, to do, um, to focus on polluter pays principle laws, right? Because I really feel strongly that um, if the polluter is benefiting and profiting, um, we really need to ensure that they are going to pay for what we have to do to mitigate the damage. So I would probably want to start with increasing the reggie per ton cost for carbon pollution. Um, I would also want to do um, a low carbon fuel standard, absolutely. I would want to extend producer responsibility laws so that we could create circular economies. I think that's really critical. Um, um, that is um, part of our big problem here. We have a lot of folks who are producing products and mm -hmm. um, they're not taking them from cradle to grave. They're basically putting them out there making a profit and then they're not, um, they're not doing anything to mitigate the damage that they're causing here. Um, I also would want to go, I think, upstream and tax those fossil fuel providers when they're bringing fossil fuels into the state. Um, I think also, I have 30 seconds left, thank you for that. I also would want to work on um, some anaerobic digestion projects. I think we can do a little bit more to incentivize. So legislatively, I'm not sure how that's going to look. But um, you gave a whole long list of, um, of legislative ideas that were revenue generating and um, wonderful suggestions that would help us to sort of be in sync, right? Because what you're saying I, with your, with your um, suggestions is that we're not in sync with the climate leadership goals. Oh, I have time. Okay. Um, quick lightning round question, Laura. Have you ever driven an electric car? Oh, actually an electric car is, is, um, is next on my list. I have a big old Jeep. And um, it's, uh, it's about time for me to get a new car. So the Prius is the next car I'm gonna be purchasing. So I have not driven it yet, but th that's the next car I'm buying. Okay. <laughs> um, so the parts of Long Island that are encompassed by District 1 are renowned for their natural beauty. Uh, the district's economy is also very dependent on its proximity to the ocean. Um, given the threats that rising sea levels and more extreme weather pose to District 1's ecosystems and economy, what are your priorities for climate resiliency? Great question, um, because the Climate Re um, Leadership and Community Protection Act also included um, resiliency plans, right? And part of this whole plan was the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act. And that fund, the $3.4 billion, that fund was supposed to be used to help us build against climate resiliency, against flooding um, and other, other priorities. And unfortunately, um, because climate deniers um, in, in uh, our federal administration um, have not given us the funds that we need to be able to plug our budget hole, it's not going to be on the ballot. And that's really unfortunate because I really think that um, that fourth stimulus package not being given to us is now going to result in you know, some more damage. Once we, we, New York State, are taking the lead across the whole entire country um, to reduce our, our carbon footprint in the major sectors, in transportation, in buildings, in, um, in commercial and residential buildings, in our um, electric genera uh, generating of electricity sector. So we're taking major steps forward and we don't have the money now to be able to do the resilience, but we can do certain things, right? So we can incorporate resiliency and sustainability into state operations and projects and permits. Um, what I probably would have liked to have seen under Restore Mother Nature is for us to do restoration projects locally for the Peconic Estuary. Um, I would have liked to see maybe uh, waterfront revitalization plans, coastal rehabilitation, um, shoreline restoration projects, flood risk reduction projects, including wetland restoration. 
been so much that we have to do. Um, but unfortunately, now without that money, we're not going to be able to do a lot of them. But like I said, we can still work on those things like permitting. We can ensure we um, uh, implement the Community Risk and Resiliency Act as it's amended by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. <laughs> okay. I don't want to con continue to go over, but I'll, I'll keep talking forever. <laughs> Good thing you have that timekeeper there. See, and I lost her on my screen, so I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I so that's that. why I didn't really. <laughs> okay. Um, do you look, bring reusable bags when you go shopping? Oh, absolutely. I have a very large stock of bags um, that get um, rotated between my husband's car and my car. And um, I've been doing that for a real long time. Okay. Um, Next question has to do with pollinators and um, protecting them and um, like honeybees, beetles, butterflies, moths, hummingbirds. They're indispensable components of our food web, yet they're threatened by pesticides known as neonics. Or neonics. I'm going to say that right one of these days. I don't know how to say um, it either. <laughs> I was practicing it, especially the, all right, so anyway, uh, neonics. <laughs> have been detected in Long Island groundwater. Um, in June, the Cornell Cooperative uh, released a report on neonics in New York State and found that routine use of neo neonicotinoids, oh my God, all right. But anyway, treated seeds <laughs> um, did not increase production of corn and soybeans and in fact posed a significant hazard for pollinators. Um, if elected, how would you protect pollinators in New York? And would you support a bill to ban coated seeds? Seeds, in other words, that are coated with these insecticides. So I am aware actually of the problem. I did go to, um, to a program where I learned a lot about, um, about bees and pollinators specifically. So, and I know um, those neonicoids or Ne ne neonics, it might be. Neonicotinoids. <laughs> Neonicotinoids. Sorry. Yeah, I know that they have been found to be um, present at the same time. So paralleling the increased use of the, the pesticide, um, it parallels with the significant reduction in our bee population. So bees, as, as everyone knows, bees are responsible for pollinating. And I think from what I remember, it was about half. So since like the 1940s, we saw somewhere around 6 million um, colonies of bees and now we're down to about 3 million. So what Cornell Cooperative um, found in this presentation that I saw um, is that the population is being reduced for many reasons. There's some type of, um, of a mite called a vera mite. Um, and also there are some viruses that attack the bees. But interestingly enough, those exist globally, but yet here in the United States, we've seen like a 40% reduction on our bee population, unlike other, other countries. Europe saw, saw like a 24% reduction. So we're seeing the parallel is that we have a significantly increased use of these um, pesticides. They're highly toxic to insects. And from what I remember, they, um, they are like they're painted on the seeds and they they're so toxic they become they become part of the plant so the leaf itself the plant the apple that itself has the pesticide in it so it's not safe and they're they're used everywhere actually in dog dog collars on lawns in people's homes in products so they can kill bees they kill birds they kill fish and they've been shown to cause problems for humans as well. So I would support banning on um, that. And I know that there is um, a law near Birds and Bees Protection Act that would give a moratorium on it. And I would be supportive of that. Um, what's your favorite park? Oh, I have so many favorite parks. Um, probably, I would say Hither Hills in Montauk. What do you like about it? Um, I just like to be able to walk around and not um, not see buildings. You know, it's just um, my husband and I were were out there recently again, and you know, it's quiet and serene. There's deer. It's very peaceful. 
All right, next question. Um, excessive nitrogen pollution from inadequately treated sewage is linked to shellfish die-offs, toxic tides, beach closures, and degradation of wetlands. To address the problem, New York State earmarked $75 million with $10 million allocated to Suffolk County to provide grants to replace polluting antiquated septic and cesspool systems for new innovative alternatives that treat nitrogen pollution. Despite this infusion of grant funding, a stable recurring revenue stream is needed to fully address nitrogen pollution. If elected, how would you help Suffolk County fight nitrogen pollution and will you support a recurring revenue stream? So one of the best ways and most um, inex um, inexpensive, least expensive ways to protect our drinking water um, and our surface water is to prevent pollution in the first place with government funded land acquisition. So one of the ways to protect our drinking water is to purchase land um, and to preserve that land. We have a lot to protect on Long Island. We sit on a sole source aquifer um, in Senate District 1. We have three estuaries and estuaries are um, known to be uh, Mother Nature's um, nursery where marine life and um, birds um, are, in, are, are actually are starting in their infancy there and move out into other environments. So we have a lot to protect, but wastewater treatment um, is one of our greatest challenges. I mean, we have um, incredibly so much um, nitrogen leaking into our, our drinking water and other chemicals as well, right? So we, we've seen PFAs, PFOs, we've seen um, these neonicotoids, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, but the most visible, I think, and alarming part about all this is that we can see the degrading of our drinking water when we see the toxic algal blooms, right? In ponds, lakes, and our bays by the excessive nitrogen. So those blooms wreak havoc on our water. Um, they, they wreak havoc on even on our economy, right? Because we're so dependent upon tourism. But in Suffolk County, we were fortunate enough um, where our county executive declared nitrogen public enemy number one a number of years ago and developed, as you know, Denise, the Suffolk County um, sub watershed waste water plan. And that plan developed a countywide wastewater management strategy Develop, um, establishing priority areas for nitrogen reduction, nitrogen lo lo load reduction goals for each area, and then um, what priority areas we're gonna go for first. And Kara Hahn, Legislator Hahn, is now um, requiring commercial and residential new construction to do IAs. But I would support a subsidy um, to ensure that that's funded, that's for local homeowners, and tax incentives as well. Probably, um, Tax incentives would be our best way to go. You, you answered another question that I didn't ask yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's sorry it. That should that. be worth a bonus. I don't know. That's all right. Um, <laughs> lightning round question. Do you carry a reusable water bottle? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and actually, I carry a re reusable coffee mug, like a travel cup. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do you support? clean renewable energy resources like offshore wind? Um, if so, how will you be a champion for this once in a generation industry that's coming to Long Island? And if not, please provide your reasoning. This is, this is just, um, for me, such a top priority. Um, very excited about, I'm so glad to ask this question. Um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act set our carbon emission reduction limits to decarbonize New York's economy. Right, and the biggest offender, and this was a surprise to me when I really started to dig in, the biggest offender was our transportation sector, right? 36% of our carbon emissions pollution basically is coming from transportation, but our electricity generation sector is, is up there as well. So what we have to do is we have to transition to renewable, sustainable um, um, electricity generation. Right, and that's going to happen. I'm so excited because New York State is going to be um, our rate. We're going to be right here in SD1, the first recipient of um, the, the actual implementation of the New York State Offshore Wind Master Plan. So it's really exciting. 
Um, we have to meet some energy goals, right? So the energy goals under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act is that we have to have 70% of the state's electricity from renewable sources by 2030. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that with the master plan. So that master plan was developed for like over many years, many folks sat at the table, they collaborated, all the stakeholders were present. We have the South Fork Wind Farm, which is planned to be about 35 miles off the shore of Montauk. It's gonna power about 70,000 homes on the South Fork. It's gonna be about 15 turbine turbines. Then that's the first project. Then we have Sunrise Wind and Empire Wind. That's gonna be another 1,700 megawatts for Long Island, New York City. But just as a side note, um, which I think is really interesting for everyone to know, um, generally on Long Island, electricity demand is going down, but not on the South Fork in SB1. So that's why we have to ensure that that project gets completed first. And the siting is going to be accelerated because the governor passed in the budget bill the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act, which creates a commission first in the nation for renewable energy siting to help accelerate the process. Um, why, did, why isn't it going down on the South Fork? Right now, why is it not? Yeah. I mean, if it's going down everywhere else on Long Island, but not the South Fork. And is there anything to be done about that? So the South Fork wind farm right now, there are some issues, right? Um, is that what you're talking about, Denise? No, I'm talking about consumption. Uh, it's it, it, usage. You, you said it's going down everywhere on Long Island, but not on the South Fork. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it probably is related to the fact that we have a lot of folks moving out to the South Fork, right? So the generation, right now we have um, Northport, which runs actually about only 44% 40, of the time. Um, we have, um, let's see, Port Jeff, which runs only about 18% of the time, and Island Park, which is about 11% of the time. So those are the three legacy fossil fuel plants. But on the South Fork, the demand is the highest. And, you know, my, I'm, I'm actually just guessing here that it's because of the, de the demand, the increased demand is a result of the increased development and um, the increased population that they have. We could look at conservation measures too, maybe. Um, What's that? Maybe look at conservation measures too, education and conservation. Um, so speaking of education, <laughs> um, education and the community and grassroots organizing is really the key to community support and engagement. Um, as an elected official, you know, know that, um, or you would know that. Do you plan on actively engaging with environmental groups and coalitions via town halls and or Zoom meetings? You know, I'll tell you, I have um, had the privilege um, of for the past 25 years um, running an organization. I founded the Crime Victim Center. Actually, it's a rape crisis center about 25 years ago from a room in my home um, and developed that organization, built it to become a multi-million dollar not-for-profit employing about 30 full-time staff. And the way that that happened is through engagement in the community. It's through bringing stakeholders to the table developing programs and implementing those programs and evaluating the efficacy of those programs is all about being at the table with stakeholders and communicating with your community. And whether that, for me, that, that effort was about educating folks about prevention, crime prevention, sexual abuse prevention, um, hate crime prevention, and what to do when something happens in your life that is crime related. So for me, outreach is something that I so um, enjoy and have had the privilege of being part of for the past 25 years, Denise. And, I, and, and it's so critical in order to get your message out because if you can't um, engage your community and you can't be there um, to understand what their issues are, you're not gonna be very effective as a lawmaker. So for me, that's um, just something I've been doing for 25 years naturally, working with local, state, and federal law enforcement, working with local, state, and federal policy and lawmakers, working with individual advocates in the community. And you know, um, for me as an advocate, right, because that's where I've been. So I've been on the side of kind of like um, you guys as conservation leaders, 
I've been the advocate for children who've been sexually victimized, for domestic violence victims, for hate crime victims. I've been the advocate, the one that the lawmaker goes to for guidance in terms of legislation. So I know how critical it is for me to be working closely with you guys because you're the experts. Very good. Um, if you're elected, what committees would you ask to serve on and why? First and foremost, I would be on um, environmental conservation, um, education, higher education, uh, probably agriculture, um, maybe crime victims, crime and corrections, if they'll have me because of my, my work um, in the community. I have a lot of expertise in that area. And also, um, I probably would want to be on um, a small business committee as well. I mean, out here, we've all suffered so much with COVID. Um, our small businesses have suffered, as have um, you know our farmers. And we rely upon our businesses to generate jobs and to keep our economy going. So I would want to be on um, a small business and economic development committee as well. Um, Where's my other lightning round question? I thought I had one there. <laughs> that was almost a lightning round question. It was pretty short. Uh, let's go back to talking about this uh, innovative septic systems um, for new construction and uh, substantial additions to new homes. There's a bill uh, pending right now in um, Suffolk County that would require the installation of those advanced systems for new construction and for uh, substantial additions and expansions of existing homes. Um, would you support additional state funds to help homeowners costs for installing these systems? I think it's critical for us to have state and maybe even, and I'm not sure because I haven't gotten to that point to work with the congressional person. I think it's important to have state and federal um, either tax incentives or funds to be able to, to, um, to have those folks put them in. Because what happened in Suffolk County, for those folks who, who didn't know, they were given uh, a 1099 um, for their grant money that they received. So they had to pay higher taxes. So that was a big surprise for someone who thought they were gonna be getting a $10,000 grant. Their income suddenly increased by a huge amount. So I absolutely would support it. And I spoke with legislator Han, um, and in my work, um, for those, for those of you who don't know my background, in my work, um, I have um, worked very closely with our county lawmakers um, in my position as the executive director of the Crime Victim Center. Um, and Kara Hahn was um, one of the early endorsers of my candidacy, Kara Hahn and Rob Clarko, presiding officer and deputy presiding officer. And I was speaking with um, legislator Hahn the other night about this program. And it does go back to the original, you know, public enemy number one that um, County Executive Steve Ballone declared nitrogen to be, um, especially here for Suffolk County. And I really do believe it's, it's so critical for those new construction projects to have those IEs in, and also for, um, for homes that are doing, um, or residential homes where they're doing larger um, re renovations. But I absolutely will work very, very hard to try to find where we can get funding streams to help fund that. I mean, it's critical. This is our drinking water. It's a sole source aquifer. It's incredible to me <clears throat> that more people aren't jumping up and down with a bullhorn <laughs> and saying, hey, we have to do something about this. But there are priority areas, and those priority areas have been identified, and it costs money. So will, I will, you have my commitment that I will do anything I can as a state lawmaker and even work with my federal partners to get funding for these um, IA systems. Um, in a similar vein, um, how, would you use your Senate position to help get the Calverton site where the former Grumman, um, you know, the former Grumman manufacturing site is in Calverton, would you use your position to help get that cleaned up by the Navy and north of Grumman? Yeah, that's the Apcal site, right? That's right, yes. Is that the, that's the same site that has this very odd contract with Luminati? Uh, it's not exactly Luminati, but Luminati was involved in that, yes. Early on, okay. <laughs> it's Calverton yeah. Aviation and Technology. Yeah, a partner so, in that. 
Okay, understood. So, so, so um, just uh, by way of background, though, let me just, um, I, because I said this before to Mr. Palumbo, that um, the town of Riverhead actually has just uh, agreed at the request of the Navy to allow the Navy access to that site to do some ad additional testing um, uh, to see if there is additional um, evidence of uh, PFOA and PFAS pollution there, because they have found some of those. Um, you know, they have found some of that on the site. And so they want to come back on the site and they needed the town's permission to do some additional test wells and monitoring. Um, so, you know, I think um, the question here in Riverhead and in Calverton, in that area certainly is um, what, can, what can be brought to bear on the Navy and the federal government to uh, get them behind and get their dollars behind cleaning that site up and cleaning it up downstream, if you will, of, uh, you know, for homeowners and, and people that lived in that area. So it's my understanding that <clears throat> that, that was already declared a super fun site. I so I think now- I think there are parts of it uh, that, okay. yeah. Okay. So. so now, because it's already been declared a super fun site, similar to, um, to what happened um, to Lawrence Aviation over here on the West End, right? They have the DEC comes in and they've been, um, they have water purifiers that are in like two actual houses that are purifying the water. But I think that um, whatever power we have um, as state senators and also, you know, whoever is in office in um, come November, whether that person is a Democrat or a Republican, that person is going to help us to, to clean up that site because it's declared a super fun site. So we now, we're gonna be going in there and testing the wells. The county is gonna to have to help out with clean water. Those folks, you know, if they, if they find toxic chemicals in their wells, they're gonna need clean water. And we're gonna do everything we can to get that to them. And it costs a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. And you know, that money is available because I've seen, I've seen so, um, you know, this is, the processes are all new to me, um, but, you know, I don't accept no for an answer. You know me, Denise, right? So no is not an answer. No is an opportunity to talk about it. So we have to figure out what funding streams we can tap into on a county, state, and federal level to get that cleaned up. And I'm committed. That's in my district. That would be my responsibility. Okay. Um, I think another question that we asked uh, Mr. Palumbo was um, what do you think is the best use? And this I think came actually from an audience member, but um, what do you think is, is the best use of that site going forward? What, what do you see as uh, the most appropriate use for it? So, so the site, the, the site, this is the site that was donated by Grumman, right? So there's about a thousand vulnerable acres that are in there. The site right. was donated to, was given to the town for a dollar in 20, about 20 years ago by the Navy. It, Grumman used to occupy it. But yeah, that's the okay. same site. Yeah. Same site. So I think that we have to first talk about preserving the thousand acres that are vulnerable, um, protecting those thousand acres into perpetuity, because as I understand it, there's regulated wetlands, um, there are um, pine barrens, there are a variety of um, protected species that are in there too. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a short-eared owl being one of them and a, a certain type of a salamander and certain types of, of um, bird sandpipers. So first and foremost, a thousand of those acres have to be preserved. But as I also understood, the property was supposed to be used for economic development and job creation. So, so I would want to what I would want to do is I want to know what the community wants, but we need to focus on preserving the vulnerable property first and then what the community wants from there. So maybe it would be best to have it industrial or maybe it would be best to have it as um, sort of office spaces, but it really would be what the community wants. And that's something I would have to work with the community on. Okay. Um, I know Julie's got some questions from the audience. Julie, do you have those uh, handy? I do. Okay. Okay, so the first question we have is about agriculture. Um, agriculture underpins the economy and culture of Eastern Long Island. 
If elected, how would you specifically advocate for maintaining and hopefully expanding farming in the district? So agriculture is a big part of our economy, as is um, agritourism, right? So we have um, our agribusiness employees over 10,000 um, folks in the region, and it's a billion dollar a year industry, and it generates even more billions of dollars as we go out more toward tourism, travel, and hospitality. I wholly, wholeheartedly support farm preservation programs, and I will absolutely support initiatives which lower costs for farming or for farmers and require farming to be done in a safe and a sustainable way. And that's the challenge, right? Sustainable agriculture. Farmers have to be able to both have an environmentally safe way to farm and a way that makes sense to them economically. I mean, they have to make money. So what's happened is the farmland preservation program has given them opportunities because the government purchases the development rights and then the farmer gets to continue to farm their own land. I'd like to work on um, the program where um, the program a little bit because the, the development rights, I'm talking to farmers that are telling me the development rights program is very strict and it only allows them one primary means of retail. So I want to try to work with them to expand on that. And also, um, I want to work with farmers on um, finding ways for them to reduce their nitrogen output. I know right now out in um, South Hold, the farmers were talking to me about the fact that they were using um, um, crop cover to reduce the nitrogen um, seepage out. Um, but I, I'm really excited about anaerobic digestion programs and I'm not, I'm not sure um, if this is something that, I talked to a few farmers and they were not practicing that, but I think maybe we can support them through those types of programs as well. I mean, they can actually self-power their farms if they have anaerobic digestion programs in place. So we have to incentivize them to do that. Great. Um, the next question we have is, um, Meeting our emission reduction goals will require faster, more reliable mass transit, more widespread electric vehicle charging infrastructure and use of electric vehicles, and easier ways to travel by bike and on foot. How do you think the state should meet these challenges? That's a great question because, as I said earlier, Julie, when we, um, when we first started with, with the fact that I was stunned to find that the transportation sector, I mean, it was stunning to me that, that they're the biggest polluters, you know, 30, 36% of our carbon emissions are from um, the transportation sector. But right now, I know we're doing a lot. I, um, I saw that we had um, invested money in electric vehicle charging stations statewide. Um, we're doing um, incentives to, to purchase EV vehicles. Um, we're using um, a settlement, a Volkswagen settlement, to transition the transportation sector to electricity and other cleaner energies, but we have to do more, right? So part of it is, uh, is maybe it's presumptuous for me to say this, but it made sense that during COVID, the governor took a regional approach and went to um, other states to form a plan. I think we should do that. We should join the Transportation and Climate Initiative. It makes sense that we do that. Um, I think we need to establish a low carbon fuel standard. And by the way, my opponent voted against establishing that standard. Um, and we have to implement the New York Metropolitan Region Congestion Pricing Plan, which by the way, my opponent voted against that standard as well. And we have to support and encourage different types of transportation. In Suffolk County, we, um, we have the bikes program. But you know, I, I kind of go back to also supporting electrification of our transit system. School buses, railways, transit buses. In Port Jefferson, I mean, we're still using diesel. So, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to switch off in Huntington because we're not electrified yet. So there are things that we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and also we can do to, um, by like bike programs, finding different ways to transport. If we do congestion pricing, maybe folks are going to think about taking the subway or a bus. So there are things that we can do that will reduce our carbon footprint in the transport sector. Great. I just wanted one, one minor clarification. 
Um, the LCF, the low carbon fuel standard bill has actually not been voted on in the legislature. Um, so you're probably looking at the scorecard and that assesses whether or not um, someone is a co-sponsor for bill that has not uh, come up for a vote. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. I, the, oh, okay, the, yeah. Yeah, so these of them did not vote. There, there hasn't been any vote on that. Um, okay. uh, the next question we have is, um, will you fight to keep the Environmental Protection Fund fully funded at $300 million a year and help to fend off budget cuts next year from environmental programs? Absolutely. And that's really critical. We want to make sure that that fund um, is not touched because there's a habit of trying to raid those types of funds to cover um, budget holes. Um, in fact, I think on the questionnaire, you asked if we would be willing to even try to put more funds in there. And I would do that. I absolutely would. It's critical that, that you have the funding that you need to be able to protect that. We all have the funding we need to protect our environment. Great. Um, we, we know that there was a recent article by uh, an NPR that talked about the fact that so little or none of the plastic that we recycle is actually being turned into new things. Uh, much of it is buried or, or disposed of otherwise. Um, what do you think we should be doing to reduce plastic use? So that gets into a little bit of um, our complete failure, I think, on a state level to develop any type of waste management plan, a recycling plan. So um, I was stunned to find out that, uh, <laughs> that uh, we are, New York has over 30 landfills accepting over 6 million tons a year of waste from across the state. So we have to develop a waste management system that becomes, that becomes almost like a circular economy, right? So it starts with fixing our recycling market. And I think that starts with passing on uh, more extended producer responsibility laws. And they're also called cradle to grave laws. Those are laws that are going to make a producer responsible for the product that they make a profit on, um, that they have to follow it through the end. So maybe we can find another use for that product. So we can create maybe a market for glass bottles, right? Because that we had a problem here in Suffolk County with that. Maybe we can um, do something more with plastics. We have a love of plastics um, in our country and the amount of plastics that are building up in our ocean is absolutely outrageous. And we, we have to do something about it. So maybe we um, have to um, ha expand our list of recyclable materials. Maybe we should, um, as I said earlier, create some kind of market for it. So stimulate the market for recycled materials, require the sale and purchase maybe of non-toxic types of materials. Plastics can be recycled um, and we can continue to use it instead of just dumping it in a landfill. So I think that it starts though, to come full circle, it, it starts with having a good waste management plan setting goals to reduce the waste that we have going to landfills. Okay, and then the last audience question that we have is that the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, does not uh, include a prevailing wage standard. Will you support and fight for prevailing wage on renewable energy projects resulting from that law? Yes. Yeah, those are um, government funded projects. And if they're government funded projects, we should have prevailing wage. Denise, I think those are all the questions that we asked uh, Mr. Palumbo. I think you're right. That's correct. Um, so we are uh, giving each candidate a, um, an opportunity to make a three minute closing statement. Um, so Laura, countdown, you're on. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. So um, for nearly 25 years, I have delivered for Suffolk County. I've been a fierce advocate providing support and services for our most vulnerable. And for me, that was children or adults who've been harmed. But now, as we look beneath the surface of climate change and water and land conservation and protecting public health, it's clear that our environment is being harmed. And we need fierce advocates like me to join you in the battle to fight against climate deniers and against those who would exploit and harm our environment. 
I believe that producers who are earning profits have a responsibility for the products they manufacture from cradle to grave. And we should start that transition now so that when they build their recycle, so that they can build their recycling costs into their cost of doing business. Fluters have to help us cover the cost to mitigate as we transition our goal to become a carbon neutral economy. And I'm not seeking a political promotion. Um, I'm looking to follow the science and to fiercely advocate for you and for our environment. I'm a Democrat who, if elected, will be in the majority and thus I will be able to pass and deliver legislation. Unlike my opponent, he'll be in the minority and unable to deliver directly to you. In fact, even if my opponent was in the majority, he would join with other climate deniers across the state and continue to earn the D scores that he has earned from your organization over the past three years. So my opponent has voted against banning PFAs in food packaging in 19 and 20. He has voted against class C stream protections in 19 and 20. He voted against the toxic show and tell law in 18. Um, and according to your scorecard, um, he took anti-environmental actions, which I think you, you, you probably would wanna explain that after I say this, but on congestion pricing, on low carbon fuel standards, on expanding access to community distributed generations, and he didn't sponsor the Senate 768 bill to readdress lead in public school drinking water. I promise you, I will absolutely follow the science um, and I will be a fierce advocate for our environment. And I assure you, I will not be earning a D for defending what I see has become our most vulnerable and in need of protection, our environment. I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to get to know me, and I hope that I can count on your support and can join you in your efforts to protect our environment. Great, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, your being here tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Denise for being a tremendous moderator for us. We're very grateful for your help and and getting us through here. Um, I hope we hope that our audience learned a few new things about. Uh, the environment and where our candidates stand on them. If you tuned in late or you want to rewatch, this video will be up on our Facebook page at facebook.com backslash NYLCV and on our YouTube page at youtube.com backslash NYLCV. Most importantly, be sure to vote. Early voting starts on October 24th and election day is on November 3rd. And as many of you know, absentee ballots uh, are available uh, much more readily than they, they normally would be um, because of the concerns about COVID. Um, please follow us at, NY, at NYLCV on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram for updates. And if you're not already on our email list, sign up at www.nylcv.org. Thank you again tonight, and we hope you all stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you.